Welcome to the Kotki Ride Home for Friday, March 4th, 2022. I'm Jackson Bird. Today, is it possible for ocean cleanup programs to do more harm than good? And how offices, cities, and the nature of work itself might change if, as looks increasingly likely, many office jobs never return to fully on-site work. Plus, the latest Wordle-style game recommendation. Here are some of the cool things from the news today. So building on yesterday's story about the United Nations agreeing to begin negotiations on a global treaty to eliminate plastic pollution, let's talk about ocean cleanups. Ocean cleanups sound like a great idea. On the surface, we humans have polluted the ocean with our single-use plastic junk, endangering the lives of so many sea creatures, so any efforts to clean up that huge island of plastic in between California and Hawaii is great, right? According to a number of marine biologists and a new article in Vox, maybe not so much. First, that island of trash, sometimes called the Great Pacific Garbage Patch, it turns out isn't so much a cohesive island of large plastic objects as it is a much more dispersed area with pea-sized or smaller waste, much of which isn't even visible on the surface of the water, all of which makes trying to clean it up quite a bit more difficult. And despite well-publicized attempts to do so by various startups and nonprofits, a lot of those ideas don't actually make a huge dent. As Reuters reported last fall, quote, The ocean cleanup, created by Dutch inventor Boyan Slot when he was 18, initially planned on using an autonomous floating system driven by wind, waves, and currents to remove plastic. But that first system, named Wilson, bobbed ineffectively alongside the garbage until it ultimately broke. A later design, System 001B, was more efficient, but the team estimated that they would need 150 such systems to clear the patch at a high cost. End quote. Their newer Jenny system, two fuel-powered ships that sail with a large net between them, in 120 hours of work last August only managed to collect 8.2 tons of plastic. That's less than the haul of a standard garbage truck. And when the organization posted a video to Twitter of one of those nets dumping 3,810 kilograms of plastic waste into the ship last month, scientists were quick to express their skepticism. Experts thought that the plastic, admittedly mostly pristine-looking tubs and crates, should have more buildup from marine organisms on them, and be covered in stuff like algae and barnacles. Some marine biologists accused it of being a staged video to make the nonprofit seem successful and continue to get funding, of which they're not exactly short on being funded by the likes of Peter Thiel and Coca-Cola. The ocean cleanup responded by saying that the Great Pacific Garbage Patch lacks enough nutrients for marine life to grow, and that's why all the plastic looks so clean, and that UV rays kill off what little biofouling there is. Scientists didn't buy that either, though. Ocean scientist Miriam Goldstein explained on Twitter, quote, There is a very well-studied group of animals, not algae, it's true, there's little of that, that grow on the plastic out there. Hydroids, burozoans, and gooseneck barnacles are found on almost every piece. Essentially, the trash acts like tiny little islands, with small pieces hosting only a few species, and large pieces, like tangled fishing nets, hosting many more. End quote. And she additionally shared photos from other organizations and scientists who have conducted ocean cleanups of their own, and indeed some of those are covered in barnacles and other buildup. Not all of them, though. I'm not ready to make a judgment call on Ocean Cleanup's particular case myself, but Vox explains even if that video was real and Ocean Cleanup is regularly clearing plastic waste from the ocean, there are still other concerns. Quote, The organization collects plastic by dragging a shallow net between two large ships. According to Katie Matthews, chief scientist at the nonprofit advocacy group Oceana, and Clark Richards, a scientist at the Bedford Institute of Oceanography, The method is not unlike trawl fishing, so it faces the same problem of bycatch, marine life caught by accident. It's hard to collect free-floating plastics without ensnaring fish, turtles, and other animals. These creatures often die, even if they're thrown back into the water. Some scientists also worry that open ocean cleanups harm the organisms that make up an ecosystem right below the ocean's surface. Matthias Egger, a scientist at the Ocean Cleanup who has a PhD in marine biochemistry, 
told Vox that the group's approach is the complete opposite of fishing. The net is shallow and moves slowly so that fish can pass underneath it, and there are escape hatches if they ever get caught, he said. The main reason why we do what we do is to help marine life, he added, end quote. And in the latest video, people were critical that there was no bycatch in the nets, using that as evidence that the video was fake, but it seems like that's part of the successfully executed design. Another criticism still is the use of large ships that run on fossil fuels, and this is something the ocean cleanup is upfront about and hoping to change in the future. The most effective use of funds and energy, experts say, and the ocean cleanup doesn't disagree, is stopping plastic waste at the source. By that I mean, yes, reducing how much plastic we use and how we dispose of any that we do use altogether, of course, and that's what the new UN Global Treaty should help with, but also clean up programs on coasts and in rivers to stop any pollution that is there from getting to the ocean. In addition to human power on beach cleanups, Vox points to the excellent example of Mr. Trash Wheel, a current and solar-powered vessel that picks up trash from the mouth of the Jones Falls River in Baltimore, Maryland. Compared to the ocean cleanups 8 tons of trash in 120 hours, Mr. Trash Wheel's record is 19 tons in one day. Granted, that was following a particularly gnarly storm, but still. More and more Mr. Trash Wheels, by other names, are popping up in other towns. They're not exactly solving the same problem that Ocean Cleanup is trying to, although Ocean Cleanup does also have similar river trash collection systems, but they can at least help the problem of the oceans not become an even bigger problem. Quoting once more from Vox, It's like mopping up the spill when the spigot is still on, said Matthews. We can't clean up our way out of plastic pollution. And continuing from Vox, With a challenge so large and a time when climate change and commercial fishing are also threatening marine life, it might seem unwise to shoot down any ideas that could help. But marine scientists told Vox that there are plenty of other solutions that are far more effective, or at least less controversial, than open ocean cleanups. The ocean cleanup still sees a place for cleaning up the open ocean. Even if we rid beaches and rivers of plastic, Egger said, there will still be waste floating out at sea and harming marine life. We should work together on solving this rather than having these arguments, he said. End quote. This week, Google announced that their employees will be returning to the office a few days a week starting in spring. And it's made a lot of headlines because larger companies like Google are ones that people are sort of looking to as an indication of how smaller businesses may follow suit, but also because Chief Executive Sundar Pichai made a really great point about this sort of hybrid or asynchronous working, saying, quote, I think we can be more purposeful about the time employees are in, making sure group meetings or collaboration, creative collaborative brainstorming or community building happens then. End quote. And for a lot of office jobs, I think something like that probably is the future. The Wall Street Journal reported today that more and more companies are hiring teams who live in all different places, none of which sometimes are where the company is based. As Brian Chesky, chief executive of Airbnb, tweeted, quote, The place to be was Silicon Valley. It feels like now the place to be is the Internet. End quote. And Brian Armstrong, head of Coinbase, concurred, saying that Silicon Valley has relocated from California to the cloud. Adopting asynchronous models is cool and has the potential to really work for a lot of companies and certain types of roles. It will never work for all of them, though, or even all work styles, and there will definitely be growing pains. Quoting the journal, The biggest challenge to sort this huge collaboration tax, said Andy Dean, a former head of remote work for Facebook. Workers can't string together enough hours in a row to focus, so they sometimes work well beyond the traditional 9-to-5 schedule with pings and dings signaling requests coming to them from all over the internet. Going forward, Ms. Dean predicts savvy employers will help people shrink their online time. There won't be the expectation that you need to be online for 10 hours a day available to other people, she said. Instead, teams will do more front-end planning for projects and then send team members off with tasks and deadlines. For some, hybrid models can work where people come in on set days of the week, while other teams might need to work from an office for five days, two weeks in a row, to pound down a plan for a project. Then they could work from home for several weeks as they deliver that project with online check-ins in the meantime. 
end quote. Even in the design of offices, things are changing. Less siloed desks and more meeting rooms and lounge spaces. All those kind of fun perks of the big tech offices like Google and Facebook actually kind of make more sense in a new way when the office is a place you go to to collaborate and bond versus grind out some solo work at your computer. Dropbox has gone so far as renaming their offices Studios. And it's not just the design of offices that might change as less people commute into a physical office five days a week. Last week, Derek Thompson wrote for The Atlantic how we might expect cities and the nature of work overall to change as well. Thompson speculates that we might seriously see the end of the five-day work week. And I gotta say, the way he laid it out here is one of the more convincing arguments I've heard, if still quite speculative. According to Stanford economics professor Nick Bloom, the most popular work from home days are Mondays and Fridays, and it's easy to see those becoming kind of half days. You know, maybe you take a trip as a long weekend, so you're still working, but you've also started your trip. Maybe you work fewer hours simply because you're more productive at home. Whatever the case, as those two days fade a little, Bloom told Thompson, he thinks folks who can't work from home at all will start to envy those who can and push for working longer hours four days a week versus shorter hours over five. If some of those blocks fall, we could be looking at a larger disillusion of the five-day work week. In general, Thompson sees changes in the tech field as perhaps heralding changes throughout. Not immediately, of course, but maybe over time. He wrote, quote, I should stress that the majority of Americans still cannot and do not work remotely, but I've come to see the remote work revolution as akin to a cannonball being dropped in a lake, an acute phenomenon whose ripples can warp every corner of the labor force, end quote. But even if or while it's just some of those white-collar jobs that are working from home some or all of the time, that will still make a huge dent on cities. Thompson explains, quote, If office occupancy never recovers, downtown areas will experience an extended ice age. Emptier offices will mean fewer lunches at downtown restaurants, fewer happy hours, fewer window shoppers, fewer subway and bus trips, and less work for cleaning, security, and maintenance services. This means weaker downtown economies and less taxable income for cities. For this reason, some of the most outspoken advocates for return to office these days aren't chief executives, but rather politicians and state officials. In New York, Boston, and San Francisco, subway ridership could be permanently depressed. That means that transit authorities might never recover from their pre-pandemic highs, and downtown areas might never recover from the lost foot traffic from weekday shoppers. End quote. But people are still moving to cities, despite what many articles may say to the contrary. Rents have been skyrocketing back up in major cities. White-collar workers still want to live in these cities. They might just spend more time in more residential neighborhoods during the week and flock to previously more popular areas only on the weekends. But again, that's only one segment of people. And Thompson raises the good point that if some offices do sell their office space, which most are not really doing, demand for office space is only down 1%, according to Bloom, well, in New York City at least, that space could be converted into apartments, helping with our housing crisis. So that could be a positive, but it's not all good. Public transit fees may go up. Those establishments used to commuters business may suffer. As usual, the small business owners and lower income folks will struggle the most. Just like hybrid tech workers having to work through growing pains around productivity and mental health, any changes to remote work will also cause a period of growing pains that ripple out through entire cities. And by the way things look, none of these are so much if occurrences, but whens. Well, another day, another Wordle-style app. Today's is called Hurdle, and in it, you hear 16 seconds of the start of a song that you have to guess. To be more specific, you hear the first second, and then with each incorrect guess, you get to hear more of the song. Or if you are totally stumped, you can skip a guess and just hear more of the song, but it does use up a guess. Like Wordle, you get six total guesses, and there is only one puzzle per day. I am terrible at song recall, so I had to skip through all the five first guesses before I could figure today's out on my sixth guess. One thing it helps to know is that the song bank is loaded up from 
from the most streamed songs of the last decade. And I kept thinking of, like, 80s hits at first. So, of course, if the most popular songs from the last decade are not your forte, this might not be the game for you. Theoretically, though, I think this is a super fun concept, so link to try it yourself is in the show notes. And also, that rocket booster has officially hit the moon. Or at least that's what astronomers are saying. Like I mentioned yesterday, we won't actually have visual evidence until one of the lunar orbiters makes it around to that far side of the moon in a couple of weeks. So for now, we just wait. But that is it from me for this week. As always, this show was produced by Ride Home Media and Kotki.org. I am Jackson Bird, and I will talk to you again on Monday.